Thank you very much. Well, we're on to our third case study, and it's my pleasure to introduce Vicky Stone. I think we're going to be into a very interesting 45 minutes in which uh, perhaps we're going to look at things which might seem a little slower, but are as, if not more, powerful than some of the material we've seen in the last hour and a half. And uh, I've asked Vicky if she'll just talk a little bit about her own background and what it is she does. Uh, please welcome Vicky Stone from Diebelstone. Hi. Um, what I really want to get on to is obviously 3D storytelling, but I can't help but want to start, especially with an audience that I suspect doesn't know our work, with just going backwards a little bit into how we got into 3D and what we do. I'm one half of Diebel and Stone. I'm Vicky Stone and my husband, Mark Diebel. We've worked together for over 20 years making wildlife films. Um, we, we started off underwater, going all over the globe, um, freelance work, and then moved about um, 18 years ago to Africa and have never left um, and have been making wildlife films mainly for National Geographic and what was um, survival. Um, about eight or ten years ago, we were approached by Terence Malick, to, who had been closely working with Walden Media and James Cameron on what James Cameron was then doing, which was Ghosts of the Abyss for IMAX. And they were interested in us doing a wildlife um, film in IMAX. Now, at the heart of our work is, although we cover everything from underwater to aerials to macro and long lens and all the different techniques you need if you're essentially making your own films um, in wildlife, what we tend to do, sorry, just to go back a moment, is we spend two years on each film and we live with a small team in the bush um, making a single film. So we have to cover all aspects of the filmmaking and then at the edit, we'll do a rough edit in the field and then for the final edit, we will come back to the UK and do the final bits of post here, music, and write it here. Um, and so, and, um, so anyway, Terence Malick and Walden Media wanted us to look at the idea of doing a wildlife IMAX film. And we thought that was a great idea, but th in the end we didn't do it because our primary thing is to tell stories and not just to be immersed in the technology. And at that stage, all you could do with the IMAX cameras because of the cost was to rent them for a period of whatever, three months, six months, um, and then that would be it. Now for wildlife, that just doesn't work. So we kind of put it down, went off, did another 2D film, and then in 2006, um, emerged out of the bush again and realized that um, not only was James Cameron working towards Avatar for release in 2009, and we could kind of see what that had the potential of doing for 3D in digital cinema, um, but we also saw how the technology was changing so that we actually might be able to have equipment in the field for long enough to do wildlife filmmaking properly in 3D and tell a story. Um, and it, I mean, it, it seems an awful long time, but we started off with tests in Japan, looking at equipment because NHK have a very, very highly developed and sophisticated 3D research center and are leaders in perfecting 3D. They don't necessarily have content that speaks to the West that easily, but they are superb technicians, as you'd expect. Um, and then we worked with Reality um, in LA when they were doing U2 because we could see suddenly they kind of leapt forward or sort of le leapfrogged over what the Japanese were doing. But then what became probably the most exciting change was in around 2008 where we started seeing the expertise and the technology developing in Europe. And the big change for us was that suddenly we were able to work with people like Anition who became our partners on the 10-minute pilot that I'm going to show you, um, was that they were prepared to put together a rig and work with us for our specific requirements. And then we could buy the equipment to then be in the field for as long as we needed to be. So suddenly we were going to be released into actually using the technology to tell stories rather than always being constrained by how we could do or how fast we had to do things, which just doesn't work with wildlife. Just to give you a bit of background on this piece, it was shot over um, a two-week period in Kenya. Uh, it's, the aim of it was to, this, it was shot at the end of 2009, so pre-Avatar, and 
at a stage where we had no idea whether the equipment would take one look at Africa and the roads and the dust and the dirt and say, uh-uh, this isn't for us um, and all fall apart, whether we would be able to work fast enough to keep up with what was going on around us, whether the team would have to be so large that every, piece of, every animal in sight would run a mile. Um, so it's really a shake, complete shakedown to say, OK, what's possible in the wild, in the wild with wildlife? Um, it was made possible only by the fact that a whole group of um, PNS Technic, uh, Silicon Imaging, uh, Iridas, Stereotech, and others, um, and obvi obviously Inition, all came together, put in their expertise and their equipment and time for nothing, and we only had to pay third-party costs in order to actually achieve the thing. And I think that really happened because it was at the stage where the only thing people were doing were shooting sport and maybe some commercials, but everybody was desperate to say, okay, what else can we do with 3D? We were still, at that stage, we were still going out there thinking, how do we do this technically? Is it going to work? So we definitely left with our heads full of, is the technology going, you know, can we manage it? But what we were amazed at was that within a two-week period, we were, it, it worked so well, and the team worked so well, and the team was only, it was very, very small. It was uh, Mark and me, Mark was DOP, I was directing, Andy Milnes doing stereography, and then Campbell when Andy wasn't there, um, and then somebody, one assistant. And we watched all um, the footage at night on a big screen so we could see that, and it was somebody like Andy or Campbell were able to say to us, although they do some corrections, were able to say to us, yep, you'll be able to sort that out in post, don't worry about it. So we had a system that worked immediately. Nothing seriously ever broke down, and if it did, uh, I don't even think it did, but if we had any hitch, hitches, they were able to solve it as fast as we needed it. We had um, Ari Presler from Ear Silicon Imaging sending us software updates from the States overnight when Mark would say, I'd love to be able to do whatever he wanted to be able to do with the camera that he couldn't do. By the next morning, it had been sent from the States to the middle of the bush in Africa, and it was up, uploaded into the camera, and off we went again. Um, so perhaps at this point I should show it to you, and then I'll just talk a bit more about um, making it. Thank you very much. Yes. Do you have a pair? Good. OK, we'll run the hill. Thank you. Thanks. Um, just if any of you want to see any of the equipment that we were using, as I'm sure you've visited Andy Milnes and Inition, either on their stand or Andy's been running workshops, he can show you the, the equipment we were using and talk you through any of that side of it. Um, but. What I'd really like to talk about now, I mean, I, I look at this, this is now a year old, and with the rate at which 3D is, has moved in the last year, to me, this is probably the last time that I'll show it at a conference, because I feel it's time to move on. This is like a, a starting point. It tested the equipment, it showed us that what we could do in the wild in Africa, and now we need to to take it to the next stage, which is probably the most exciting stage because it's going to take it into the realms of the aesthetics. Um, and just to sort of touch on a few things that we were looking at and doing in this one rather than just literally trying to achieve it. Um, the time lapses, for example. Um, if you take 2D time lapses, one, we all accept that it's sort of an altered reality and it's sped up so that we see things that we couldn't perceive at normal speed. So we thought, well, why, why then, why don't we just add some volume to the clouds in a way that obviously is not real, it's not the way we see it with our, with our eyes, but in order to enhance that, that sense of 3D um, in, in the wide shots. So we did those on stills cameras, which we put up to 100 feet apart um, and then synced so that we could really put, we didn't have any objects in, that we was purposefully framed so that we had nothing in the shots where you'd think, gosh, that zebra's the size of a you know, toenail, that's ridiculous. Uh, we just left it so that you were in the atmosphere of the clouds, but try, gave, you know, went all the way with giving the clouds volume. So that was one of the kind of things we were, we were playing with or beginning. And as I say, I feel like it's just the beginning of what we, what we can all do and where we may all take. And I think it'll go in as many directions as there, there are creative people able to try and do things. Um, 
What we, we're also very intrigued with is the way in which you can play with the negative and positive space. Negative, obviously, being the space between the, the screen and um, the audience, and positive, the other side of the screen, in terms of building the characters. And obviously, I'm talking wildlife here, and it may, may be different for, in dramas and with people. But with wildlife, if we, we, we do, did it to a certain extent there, where the more kind of um, punchy, forward, sort of bolshy, um, confident characters were fuller, rounder, coming slightly into negative space, not so far that it was uncomfortable, and then the slightly more retiring characters are kind of dropped behind the screen, and maybe like the chameleon of, um, pops forward when, when there's a bit of action. Um, so we, I think there's an enormous amount one can do with actually playing with that negative and positive space, and obviously the volume, amount of volume one puts into different characters. Um, with with things like what we tried to do there was whenever it was lush and green and life was good, we gave as much volume as possible to the scene so that it was kind of relaxed and full. And then when, it got, when it, everything got drier and harsher, we, we flattened it off so that it, it had that kind of um, slightly uh, less hospitable feeling about it. But we, and occasionally we'd have a sort of a dilemma because, for example, something like the dead zebra where in order to make that powerful, you actually want lots of volume in it. And yet it was being in a scene where everything else, the volume had been reduced. So we kind of had to find a, a happy a halfway house between the two. Um, the, the other thing that we used a lot there was, um, which one of the earlier speakers talked about, was um, a very small interaxial when we wanted to, like in 2D, if we were filming small animals and we wanted to give them more presence, we'd get right down below their eye level and um, you know, sort of be slightly looking up at them, make them bigger and fuller. Now with 3D, I and mean, 3D is an absolute gem for macro and smaller animals because you can get right in there, give them lots of volume, give them huge presence, and sort of like a bit like the bullfrog. And in something like that, I mean, you know, what have we got? Two shots of the bullfrog. It's, the sequence doesn't go anywhere. But as I say, this, you've got to look at this as a test rather than a fully blown thing. But there's enormous potential with what, we, what you can do with, 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 with that. Um, so it's all these kind of considerations which we're now going, thinking very hard about in with wildlife, you don't plan exactly what you're going to do. We go out into the bush with the thread of the story. We know the key characters. And then it's a mixture of what happens, what you notice, and how it evolves. But if you've got in your mind all these different possibilities of how you can use 3D techniques or what might be possible, you then kind of quickly draw on them, you hope, um, while everything's happening. And I think it will evolve in the whole the two-year period when we're making the film. Um, and I have no idea where, where it'll end up. but. Um, that was the start. <laughs>